Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Oxford Arbitration Day keynote speaker interview with Honorable Charles Brower. <laughs> good afternoon, Judge Brower. Good afternoon. I mean, good. Mo yeah, it's good morning here, but that's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's, right. it's technically afternoon. That's true. There we go. There we go. <laughs> well. Um, First of all, first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for all the attendees for their loyal signing and patience to stay tuned on a Friday, perhaps Friday afternoon or Friday evening uh, for the last portion of this program. I can assure you that's going to be worth waiting. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, Andre Montero and Adelaion. Uh, Felipe Esperandil, uh, João Moreira, and Laura Parente for organizing such a wonderful program. I am so pleased, so honored, and privileged to be the person to, introdu to introduce and to interview Judge Charles Brower. Judge Brower has a long profile, but what I can say is, as a matter of introduction, he has 55, in his 55 year career, he's been in the law, um, in public service, both national and international. For nearly 40 years, he has focused on public international law and international dispute resolution. And um, with that very tiny introduction, because we have plenty, plenty of issues to cover. I, why don't we get started, Judge Brower? And, I'm ready. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, why don't you, as uh, for the sake of um, uh, uh, introduction, why don't you just tell us a little bit how, when, and where did you start your legal career? I uh, started um, just when I graduated from Harvard Law School with the uh, law firm White and Case, now known as White and Case LLP, uh, which has become a very much a global uh, law firm. I was in New York for uh, eight years. Uh, that was when, the old when York. was that? 1961. Okay. Right. And um, I was there for um, almost uh, eight years. I became a partner there basically as a general commercial uh, litigator <clears throat> doing uh, all kinds of <clears throat> interesting things like uh, defending exploding beer bottle complaints for uh, Budweiser, uh, things you wouldn't think I, that's where I really became, uh, how should I say, a real lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, But I resigned from the firm four months to the day after becoming a partner mm -hmm. to go to the State Department in the Office of the Legal Advisor for four years in the uh, Nixon administration. And, um, and then White and Case opened an office in Washington, uh, where I was off and on for many years, uh, excluding the years that I was, um, that I've been in The Hague total of 21 and a half years in The Hague as a judge of the Iran United States Claims Tribunal and uh, now of sitting in three cases as a judge ad hoc of the International Court of Justice. So, Okay. During, this, during your period, your tenure at White and Case, did you have any uh, contact with international arbitration by then? 
Uh, not really. Uh, you realize in 1961, there wasn't much in the way of international uh, uh, arbitration. Anyone uh, interested in doing international work had to be doing corporate transactional work. And I found that anathema. I was in litigation. Uh, and I'd like to, <laughs> to uh, how, how should I say, I shouldn't say fight, but uh, match wits in in real time with, uh, with uh, other counsel and um, to some extent with the judges. Okay. Okay. And um, let me uh, let me ask you some sort of a personal uh, question here. In terms of um, um, you have this fifty-year uh, uh, career, uh, stellar career, I would say. Um, would you have any um, um, specific hobby or anything that you like to do outside the legal environment? <laughs> You know, every time I'm confronted with a, a, a form uh, for biography and it asks you at the end any any hobbies, and um, I, the reality is uh, all my professional life, I've been living my hobby. Uh, hmm. And it's uh, I, that's not to say that I'm uh, necessarily a workaholic, although uh, I suppose I might qualify. I just love what I do, and I keep on doing it. I say, uh, uh, when I'm asked, uh, gee whiz, you haven't retired. And I said, it's not in my vocabulary. I will be retired by forces beyond my control. So, um, but if I were to fill it in, uh, apart from what I've just said, I think I would say, I love to host very nice dinners uh, with up mm. to 12 or so people who actually have something to bring to the table uh, culturally, intellectually, with the very best of uh, food and the most excellent uh, wines and uh, all uh, infused with a, a really educational, interesting and pleasant conversation about all sorts of subjects. Interesting, and I and I love I love hearing that uh, uh, this expression. I am leaving my hobby. <laughs> this is fascinating. This is some, this is already a piece of advice to the current and especially to the young generation. Do what you love, uh, and love what you do. And uh, so this is something that I can get from your comment. <laughs> If you have the opportunity, that's, uh, that's the, only, it's the only way to go. I say I've never had a job um, in the sense of, you know, doing something for pay that maybe is not your ideal. I've been blessed that way. And so that's certainly, certainly you are. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, why don't we move now to your uh, um, your service, your performance uh, in your role? in the Iran and in the United States claims tribunal. Um, as I understand, you've, you've, you served as judge in this tribunal for many years, and uh, perhaps you, you are still there. But uh, So can you just uh, 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 share some highlights of such experience, please? <clears throat> Well, it's been a very interesting uh, experience. It seems that uh, Iran, although I've never uh, been there in my life, has infused uh, many years of my professional life, both uh, as uh, advocate, uh, mostly as a judge of the Iran United States Claims Tribunal, now as a judge ad hoc of the um, International Court of uh, uh, of Justice. It's um, it's very very interesting. Obviously, uh, it's uh, quite an achievement mm. uh, that these two countries, which have not had diplomatic relations since uh, about April of 1980, when uh, when uh, President Carter mm. launched a failed uh, raid of the Delta Force at Desert One in an attempt to try and uh, Ex extract the uh, 52 hostages. Um, and yet, um, we all get together in The Hague. It's been going on since um, 1981, mm -hmm. uh, actually. Uh, and uh, we've been through different uh, phases. At the beginning, uh, they really sent, uh, re uh, how should I say, revolutionary uh, devotees. Mm. Uh, it was less pleasant. Uh, and in fact, on the 4th of September, 1984, two of the then Iranian 
judges uh, physically attacked uh, one of the third country judges, a, uh, a an elderly Swedish uh, judge really? who happened to be chairman of the chamber in which I was sitting. In those days, we were mostly working in chambers of three, one American, one Iranian, okay. and uh, chaired by a third country. Um, eventually, uh, this tells you something about how sort of the Iranian mind works. Uh, those two are challenged by the United States. Um, and while a challenge was uh, pending, of course, uh, Iran did not do what it could have done, uh, which is say, we accept the challenge uh, and we'll send some new people. Uh, we just got it while a challenge was still pending. And I think it would have been granted uh, for obvious reasons. We just got a, the president of the tribunal received a letter from the uh, agent uh, for uh, Iran saying, starting on such and such a date, two new judges will arrive from Iran, which the majority of the tribunal then decided uh, uh, was actually an acceptance of the challenge. And uh, of course, those two people left and were replaced by <coughs> uh, by two others, uh, with one exception, which is very unusual but uh, understood understandable by the uh, because of the circumstances. It has never happened that any uh, of the three Iranian judges, were three Americans, three Iranians, and three third country uh, nationals, no Iranian has ever voted other than for the position of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, American judges uh, have voted uh, differently uh, at times, even to find there's no jurisdiction uh, mm -hmm. and to uh, sometimes find that uh, it just wasn't a good case for the American claimant on the, um, on the merits. Um, you might say those are rare. Um, they're not numerous, but essentially the uh, tribunal was established to um, pay off American claimants on such claims as were uh, justified, had very few Iranian claimants, um, although they could have come near. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an interesting experience. And uh, I, I was confronted once um, early on there, when I was there back in the 80s, the f I've been there at two different times, uh, actually physically living in The Hague. The um, my Iranian colleague, whose family still lives uh, in the Netherlands, although mm -hmm. he does some work, of course, in, uh, in, in Iran, said, you know the difference between you Americans and us Iranians? And I said, well, I think you're going to tell me. And he said, yes. He said, uh, the house that we live in uh, has uh, a, uh, a ground floor in the front and then a floor below that. Uh, which opens out into a garden with sliding doors. And uh, we were up on the ground floor in the kitchen one evening, and I heard sounds as though someone maybe had entered below. And so <clears throat> I went down there, and yes, someone had come in. As soon as he saw me, he ran out the back. Uh, I ran out the back. Uh, we had a fence or a wall around our uh, garden. He leapt over that. I leapt over that and I chased him as hard as I could down the street. Now he was able to outrun me, but if I had ever caught him, I would have beaten the living daylights out of him. Now he said, that happens in America. What does an American do? American goes down, sees, oh, the guy's out, he's gone, he's over the fence, yeah, okay. Maybe you call the police, uh, but that's the difference between us. He said, okay. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot uh, a lot of truth uh, uh, in that. Interesting, and I'm gonna. Uh, this is uh, I'm going to uh, as we move along. I'm, I'm going to touch on some cultural differences. Uh, yes, and especially in the field of international arbitration. But just to close this topic, if you can and if you may, what are the remaining issues before the tribunal? If you can um, share with us. Right. Um, well, it uh, since I uh, resumed residence there at the beginning of um, 2001, uh, we were already then just dealing with uh, cases between the two states, between Iran and the United States. And uh, those cases, um, um, some of them are contractual cases, um, 
usually dealing with foreign military sales program mm. that the United States had. All of the, they take a long time because they're all done with all nine judges. Uh, we, we have no cases uh, in, in chambers anymore. Okay. Uh, and I tell you, the, uh, the, the other Iranian quality, which has been confirmed to me by uh, Iranian friends one makes along the way uh, in the tribunal, is, is you just don't give up arguing in deliberations uh, unless and until either one of two things happens. The mm -hmm. president of the tribunal says that's enough, uh, which is a rarity, uh, mm -hmm. or they become convinced that there simply is no more room. They, they, mm. they, they're, they're just, that's it. That doesn't happen a lot at the tribunal. So the deliberations yeah. can be extremely long. Interesting. And I, rem I remember attending a, a White and Case, my former firm uh, uh, event uh, back in the 80s uh, in, in New York. And I was, you know, well, why, why do you want to be in the Hague and doing what you're doing with these Iranian revolutionaries instead of enjoying the glories of litigation in the city of New York and in the United States? And I said, I have to tell you. Everything I ever learned as a uh, New York City street fighting brass knuckles litigator, uh, which is somewhat typical of a lot that goes on in New York City, is totally applicable to deliberating at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal uh, with the Iranians basically on the other side and everybody competing for the uh, favor or the vote of the uh, third country members. Interesting, interesting, um, very uh, fascinating experience. <laughs> uh, um, it's a um, patience uh, experience uh, as well. Um, uh, let's uh, let's move now to arbitration. Um, uh, when when and how did you start your um, you make your first steps in the world of international arbitration? Right, um, I would say it was in. Uh, 1979 or 1980. I mean, I was already uh, 40 years old before the first arbitration get along, came along because okay. it's a field that's developed uh, only after I had uh, uh, <laughs> arrived okay. on the threshold of um, of uh, middle age. Was uh, it domestic or international arbitration, if I may ask? I'm sorry. It was. Was it a domestic, a purely no, no, domestic no, no, case actually, or international case? No, my very first case was an ICSID. It was one of the very first ICSID cases. Okay. Uh, we had uh, been representing uh, Indonesia okay. uh, for some times, and a case which uh, uh, sort of uh, ICSID uh, devotees will recognize the Amco Asia case versus. Uh, Indonesia, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw that that was uh, happening, and uh, so I wasn't contacted by Indonesia, but I saw there was this case, so I uh, prepared a memorandum uh, about the case and what what they should do, and so on and so forth. The uh, in any event, uh, that was the first uh, one, and the next one uh, came soon after that. Was chosen to uh, represent uh, uh, some good old boys from Oklahoma who were a big you know, driller for oil and and gas on uh, land, uh, and um, they had a problem in. Um, Algeria. And um, so as soon as I had two cases, I decided, uh, okay, comparatively speaking, I'm an expert and went out on the speaking circuit. And uh, yeah, and, and the rest is, and then pretty soon I was appointed by the Reagan administration to the Iran United States uh, Claims Tribunal. And when I came back from uh, that after between four and five years in 1988, uh, that had given me a, a, a profile as well as an acquaintance uh, with uh, various international American international arbitration lawyers who had cases before me at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal. So that really uh, helped me uh, develop that practice uh, for me and for the firm. I, I, I certainly believe so. Um, what a dynamic, what a dynamic professional, uh, professional career. Um, uh, 
Uh, now, in terms of um, uh, international arbitration or even uh, domestic or arbitration as a whole, uh, in your opinion, what are the most important characteristics of an arbitrator, an international arbitrator? It can be also investment in state, international, commercial, or domestic. What is the most important characteristic of an arbitrator? Well, in uh, a word, I guess I would say uh, to be an internationalist. Mm. Uh, of course, an excellent uh, lawyer, uh, but someone who possibly has command of uh, a language or two other than one's native language, mm. uh, one who knows the world uh, more than uh, many people do, appreciates the different uh, cultures and the uh, influences that they may have uh, on the uh, views of uh, colleagues. Uh, it's uh, being a, an international arbitrator has actually been a, a wonderful way of meeting some of the most impressive and uh, interesting and sometimes entertaining uh, also people uh, one, one, one can imagine, uh, but they need to have a, 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 a clear mind, total independence, uh, impartiality. Uh, and um, I never thought um, I would become a judge of any kind, and I've not been a, a domestic uh, judge, uh, obviously. But when I arrived at the Iran-United States Claims Tribunal after a career of um, representing clients, I thought, gee whiz, this is really great. The salary comes in every month uh, regularly, and it was uh, very respectable. The Iran-United States Claims Tribunal, and my only duty is to do what I decide must be the right thing in the case without any uh, concerns about <laughs> partners in the firm, uh, clients, um, so on and so forth. It, it's a really a in, in, Interesting, period. interesting. Um, uh, of course, uh, impartiality, independence, uh, these are very, um, you know, corn store of um, mm -hmm. uh, arbitrator's uh, 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 service. But you've mentioned also some uh, understanding or having knowledge with uh, maybe language. Yes. Um, so from what you said, I understand that it is uh, important or it is a plus to speak other languages so that you can understand better what, uh, or even uh, not only language-wise, but also cultural-wise, what counsel is trying to say. Do you think that uh, being a polyglot, do you think it really helps or sometimes it does not help because once you need some translator or interpreter before the tribunal and you know that the translator is not translating the way you understand because you speak the second language, <laughs> when the witness is speaking his or her own language and you understand, but the interpreter somehow didn't catch or didn't get the point and there is some sort of a mistranslation. Do you leave this situation that according to you, to the opposing counsel, in order to address this or you intervene? Um, well, that's, uh, uh, that's a very interesting question. I'm trying to remember uh, situations um, uh, where I've been first off the, uh, uh, off the mark. I think in those situations, actually uh, a member of the counsel team always uh, has the assignment of monitoring the interpretation, the simultaneous interpretation. And they're very fast, uh, very quick at saying something is wrong. So I haven't been in a position uh, of, um, of, of being the first to uh, say something uh, uh, on that. Uh, although I may well have noticed something, but uh, we're always, we're always <laughs> they're faster on the draws. We, uh, uh, as they used to say in the old West in my uh, uh, country uh, than, than the arbitrators. Okay, uh, you may have covered already this one, but uh, just to make sure that um, we are, um, um, that uh, we are on the same page, if you will. Uh, from the arbitrator's perspective, what are the main differences 
and caveats in handling international commercial vis-a-vis -vis international or investment state arbitration. By the way, is there any difference for them from the perspective of the arbitrator? Uh, well, I was privileged to give what's known as the Alexander Lecture some uh, years ago for the Chartered Institute of uh, uh, Arbitrators, <clears throat> and um, in which I coined the uh, term, which I've rarely heard since, but some people have uh, picked it up, investomercial arbitration. Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the, the classic distinction uh, between commercial arbitration and investor state arbitration is, um, is somewhat uh, a false uh, hmm. separ separation. The real difference uh, is whether you have a uh, state party uh, normally respondent, obviously, although it happens the other way around sometimes. Uh, as soon as you have a state involved or a state entity, particularly a wholly owned state oil uh, company of an oil producing country, you're in a different, you're, you're in a, in a potential circus uh, that uh, virtually never applies when you have two private parties, no state ownership uh, with a contractual uh, with a contractual problem. Uh, when states and governments and politicians um, and, and big demands uh, by claimants are involved, uh, you will have a wholly different experience uh, than if you have a strictly private uh, arbitration. And of course, the law is different. Treaties are involved in some cases. Contracts and treaties are involved in some cases. Uh, and sometimes with states, uh, only a contract uh, is involved. Still, uh, that, uh, that happens. So, uh, well, the rules under which you're uh, uh, playing and the uh, governing law uh, will uh, very likely be uh, different. Uh, it's a whole different, uh, whole mm. different operation. So mm. it's um, some cases are political, no matter what the basis uh, is, and uh, you will have a lot of experiences that you are not likely to have in a strictly two private parties working off a contract case. Interesting, interesting. Um, let, me, uh, let me move now to a topic uh, of uh, confidentiality. Um, mm -hmm. Investment uh, state cases, they are public by nature. And as a result, they create a sort of uh, case law for the users for everyone who are interested in, internet, in investment in state cases. On the other hand, international commercial arbitration are not so. Uh, although there is a trend of disclosing more uh, data, more information uh, for the arbitral community as a whole. My question to you is, do you think the confidentiality, what do you, let me put it this way, what do you think is going to be the future of confidentiality in international commercial arbitration? Oh, the um, situation with, um, uh, <laughs> I will say, um, arbitrations between two strictly private uh, 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 parties is I, it's a, it's a rare case in which either party wants a lot of publicity uh, about it. And uh, often there are uh, issues of, uh, of commercial, uh, commercial uh, secrets or trade secrets uh, that are, don't want to be disclosed, that people don't want uh, disclosed. So I don't see that that's um, going to be a... Uh, uh, become a become a trend, uh, mm. and of course, there's a situation where, uh, let's say, maritime arbitration, where you have uh, certain people uh, doing all of the doing all of the cases. They uh, they'll know all they need to know anyhow. Just as uh, arbitrators who are, and there are such who are frequently appointed by 
uh, insurers or reinsurers uh, in catastrophic liability uh, cases. You get to know all the cases if you sit in, sit in enough of, <laughs> of, of them, you know all you need to know. The situation is much different with respect to um, cases involving uh, uh, cases involving uh, governments actually uh, the cases uh, in which governments have uh, fought against uh, disclosure uh, I have judged to be cases in which the government doesn't want the people of the country to know mm -hmm. what's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. That does happen from time to time. And then there are others such as under the NAFTA uh, regime, which is now uh, changing, but probably not in this uh, regard where, um, you know, Canada and the United States and Mexico wanted everything. They'd, they'd post everything on their, uh, on, on their uh, foreign office or relevant ministry um, ministry uh, websites and obviously transparency is is just increasing like mad uh in the field of um, cases involving governments correct yes yes correct okay um let me uh, uh touch on a topic uh, oh by the way for for the record i have prepared some questions here for judge brower without any assistance from Judge Broward. So this is something that uh, I prepare myself, and um, I am uh, taking this uh, advantage of uh, raising those questions as we move along. Now, in terms of appeals, uh, we we've, we've mentioned users, right? So users mean states or private parties, etc. But um, the, uh, we can see today that uh, some institutions, they start amending their arbitration rules to include an opt-in appeal mechanism. Uh, do you think, again, do you think this is a trend? Do you think this is something that, um, uh, well, first of all, do you think this is showing something for the arbitration as a method of solving conflict as a whole? Or do you think this is just a, uh, an option that parties may have according to their, you know, once they draft the agreement, they may say, well, let, let's put this an appeal uh, in, the, uh, in the arbitration system. But uh, what is your opinion regarding uh, this uh, scenario? Is it, is it a trend or if this is just a, is not a trend? Uh, well, uh, since it never existed until uh, not too many years ago, I guess you could, and it now does, it's, um, you might say it's a, a trend in a sense, but it, it doesn't seem to me a very, <coughs> excuse me, a, a very uh, strong trend other than the fact that the uh, European Union uh, concept of having a 15 member uh, all state appointed uh, international investment court, which I have uh, spoken and written very much uh, against and have, as an observer at working group three of UNCITRAL, certainly have spoken against that uh, envisages an appeal uh, mechanism. It'll appeal to some, uh, but not to others. If for example, you're a major your uh, multinational uh, corporation, while you do care whether you win or lose, the reality is you'll have a certain number of, of uh, arbitrations, uh, and some of them you'll wish to have a continuing uh, relationship uh, with, uh, with the other party, if it, particularly if it's uh, not one of these cases where a government and investor have a complete falling out and, and there isn't any potential future relationship. Uh, but you basically, uh, I think, uh, the major um, um, multinational uh, users of uh, arbitration, they, they want to get a result and, and move right. on. Uh, okay. They don't want to be dragged out forever as though they were in, uh, in court. There may be others who, uh, for whatever reason, maybe states, uh, you know, they don't care. They want to win. And, and, yeah. and sometimes they don't care what it costs. So it's, yeah. uh, it varies. I don't know where it's going. Yeah, interesting. And I, I, and I raised this because in one of my cases, I was sitting as an arbitrator and uh, the clause called for an appeal. 
Mm-hmm. In, during the preparatory conference, preliminary conference, or case management conference, whatever you call. So um, I try to, uh, to discuss with the uh, parties if they really wanted to keep that provision and they said yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was expecting. I was expecting a no answer, but uh, the answer was yes. So uh, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, was interesting. Let me. Uh, let me step back uh, to uh, um, uh, arbitrator's appointment. Yes. Uh, and this is something very interesting. In 2013, you co-authored an article at the in the uh, arbitration international called the death and two-headed Nightingale, why the Paulson Vandenberg presumption that party-appointed arbitrators are untrustworthy and wrong-headed. <laughs> so my question to you is, is party-appointed arbitrator at stake? Or rather, it represents a well-established right of the parties in an essential phase of the arbitration process. Well, I think that the um, uh, <clears throat> arbitration, which uh, is a consensual uh, process, um, is uh, definitely furthered by the fact that each party, each side of a case, uh, is involved n- not just in the selection of one arbitrator, but in the usual three-member uh, tribunal. Uh, they have a role directly or indirectly through an appointing authority uh, of having, uh, including um, a role in the uh, appointment of the uh, president of the tribunal. So um, it's very important for them to have the have have the buy-in. They're part of the construction of the tribunal, which will judge them and they um they're nobody likes to lose uh but it's a different situation if you've had a role in constructing uh composing the 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 tribunal i think that's very uh that's extremely important uh those who uh, deal with the international court of justice will be aware of the fact that uh we're there's a case, a contentious case between two states, uh, and if one of them, uh, with respect to one of them, or with respect to both of them, none of the 15 elected members uh, of the International Court of Justice as the nationality of that country or the, either of those countries, uh, those countries have a right to appoint for the purposes of that case someone as judge ad hoc who has all of the uh, um all of the powers and rights and so forth of any judge uh, of the tribunal uh, for the purposes of that case. This was invented by Elihu Root a long ago, where early 20th century secretary of state and a great New York uh, lawyer. And it was, uh, it's been carried forward uh, since the establishment of the permanent court of international Mm. uh, justice following the Treaty of Versailles until uh, today, having buy-in a role and it makes a difference. And I think that if the uh, European um, Union thought of having a 15 member um, international investment uh, court Mm. composed only of people who are appointed by states uh, will drive people who have the opportunity to uh, stay away from it, uh, to try and stay away from it, either through contractual relations instead of relying on a treaty or whatever else they can they can figure out. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, a, it's essential to the success of, of arbitration. Okay, okay. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't you be concerned um, with... Um, now, um, there are so many players in <laughs> international arbitrators. And by players, I mean parties, arbitrators, counsel, um, experienced and unexperienced counsel, arbitrators, and parties. Um, wouldn't you be concerned that um, the interview, the possible, interview between counsel and potential arbitrator um, would go uh, a little bit too far 
based on this proliferation of uh, parties, uh, arbitrators, and counsel, or this is it's not a matter of concern? <clears throat> Well, I think one does need to be careful. I'll be frank to say I have always submitted to uh, interviews uh, by uh, um, by a party considering appointing me as a, as a party a party appointed arbitrator. I've not been interviewed by both parties uh, for the position of president or or chairman uh, of of the tribunal. That that rarely happens in practice. But unlike some of my uh, uh, confrere, I, um, I submit to arbitrations because I think if the party wants to do that, it's because uh, the management, uh, not just the uh, council, uh, want to be comfortable with the with the choice if they're not if, if it isn't someone who already know, knows me and uh, usually the the uh, parties don't know me before often the council uh, are they have to be satisfied because the um, if things go south uh, in the case uh, the the general counsel is going to want to say look first of all I collaborated with our uh, uh, outside counsel and uh, and this was a real star you know it's, it's someone that nobody can uh, attack uh, basically uh, uh, and uh, and and the president needs to uh, ceo needs to answer to the board uh, so if people want to get comfortable and i've had them travel a long way sometimes to interview me in the in in the, in the hague and uh, frankly i arrange uh, uh, they can have lunch with me in the uh, restaurant des juges which is reserved otherwise for you know, diplomats and judges and so forth, or people involved in the Peace Palace, uh, I think they should uh, do that. Now, of course, I've never, never, uh, has any council ever uh, looked like uh, he or she was going to cross the line of what's uh, what's appropriate? We talk okay. about we talk about right. you know family, our countries, culture. Right. Uh, you know, they just yeah. need to know if uh, want to be sure. Well, they'll know ahead of time whether they have a conflict. Obviously, right. So I think that's the right thing to uh, uh, to do. Right. Yeah. I, I, yes, I agree. Yes. The, uh, the arbitrator's behavior and position is very important to set up this limit, this uh, boundary. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's move to uh, counsel then. Uh, how would you describe a good counsel in international arbitration in any particular piece of advice to the young and even the current generation regarding a good counsel. Right. <clears throat> well, know your case. Basically, be honest with the tribunal and be polite and respectful and don't get into uh, intellectual fistfights with opposing counsel. That gets nobody anywhere. It's just a, uh, a distraction. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have a horrible counsel uh, before you, but it turns out uh, their client has the right side of the case. And, and you have to, <laughs> I've been in cases where you say, well, you know, in, 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 in a sense, it's too bad uh, uh, that the party represented by this person who has just, you know, been the source of torture uh, has the right side of the case, but that's how you have to decide. But it is no need for the unpleasantness uh, uh, along the way. Uh, be aware and don't hide the weaknesses of your case and be aware, but don't overstate the strength of your case. The people who are most successful and I know most respected by other arbitrators are those who are just very straightforward uh, and, uh, as I say, polite, uh, respectful, mm -hmm. well-behaved, uh, but uh, know how to present a case and present it uh, and present it right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. that's the only way to go. Yes, uh, and um, uh, you've mentioned uh, know your case. Oh yeah, I would add know your audience uh, as, as <laughs> yes. well. 
right? So how to present a case before an arbitral tribunal composed of civil law lawyers or a tribunal composed of com only common law lawyers. Yeah. So, um, uh, so on, on that regard, so perhaps we could um, we could go uh, to a topic of soft laws that they are they are there in order to bridge these differences and different cultural um, idiosyncrasies, etc. Do, uh, do you really think those soft laws they help to bridge these different cultures and different idiosyncrasies, uh, or do you think the a good arbitrator, an experienced arbitrator, a good counsel, an experienced counsel would not need those soft laws? Well, <clears throat> I think they play a very Im important role because the, um, the, uh, the um, how should I say, gathering uh, from, in particular, the uh, International Bar Association um, um, arbitration people, uh, calling upon in the in the committees that uh, do this uh, on civil law lawyers, common law lawyers, people from different parts of the uh, w world, and coming up with their um, basically uh, rules on um, uh, presenting evidence in international arbitrations on conflicts and so forth they uh, they already represent a uh, <clears throat> kind of a coming together of international arbitration experts uh, from around the world as to what they can agree on uh, commonly and so they are on the pre presentation of evidence for example they are commonly uh, included in ICC terms of reference or in uh, in uh, uh, terms of appointment or procedural orders number one uh, as mm -hmm. um, as guidelines they're mm -hmm. rarely accepted Guided. accepted as fixed but guidelines is enough and people people follow them uh, mm -hmm. I think they, those are are very very good developments and I do uh, there is uh, there have been so many cases in which uh, the tribunal consists of uh, a mixture of civil law lawyers and common law uh, lawyers that after uh, some time of experience uh, together, um, they, they, they begin to appreciate uh, others, uh, other systems. I know Karl-Heinz Böckstiegel from Germany, who mm -hmm. was president of the Iran United States Claims Tribunal and, sure. and a terrific one, and uh, someone with whom I've sat in a number of cases uh, 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 since then, has uh, often expressed uh, his uh, having come to an appreciation of the Anglo-Saxon system of uh, cross-examination of uh, witnesses. Now, I, I know there are still some uh, civil law trained uh, lawyers who basically don't want to hear testimony from uh, anybody who knows what happened. Uh, they, they just figure uh, you, you can't rely on someone who is an officer, director, or uh, mm -hmm. employee uh, mm -hmm. uh, of a party, and they look at the uh, look at the documents. Mm -hmm. I think that's largely been uh, been watered down. But I remember asking. <laughs> Right, right, right. Uh, it's anyway. I think it's uh, it comes more and more to there's more and more of a convergence with the exposure of everybody to the other systems. Okay, okay. Uh, let's let me switch gears now to um, I would say uh, the um, uh, the hot topic of this this year, 2020, which is uh, uh, COVID. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, well, the, the, the famous uh, scientist, uh, biologist, and botanic English man, Charles Darwin, yes. used to say that the only unchangeable thing in life are the changes. So we are living what we call the new normal. And this new normal goes also to arbitration hearings. D uh, I would like to know a little bit of your... Uh, inside your inputs regarding arbitration hearings, and if you think those virtual or remote hearings are going to be here for 
unforeseeable future, regardless the arrival of a vaccine. Do you think that, um, and also, if I may, uh, just to cover all this COVID uh, uh, topic, do you think that always, always a virtual hearing is now um, necessary? Or is there any way that despite of COVID, uh, in-person or somehow hybrid hearing is necessary? <clears throat> Well, under present circumstances, uh, I have not had a hybrid hearing, although in one case, a uh, party very much insisted upon it, but was uh, overruled uh, by the uh, uh, tribunal. Uh, that will probably be used against the tribunal if that party loses and seeks uh, further uh, relief. But there have been very few, very few cases of which I'm aware uh, in which there has been uh, incredible uh, in, in insistence on an in-person or even a hybrid uh, hearing. And um, I, I have heard of in-person hearings that have taken place, um, well, great for them i'm i'm not willing to <laughs> risk i'm not willing to risk uh traveling uh, across the atlantic or the or the pacific at this particular uh point uh and i think a lot of uh i've been involved with different uh systems different operators of the system they've all worked uh, quite well and i think the um um, conditions that are uh, imposed are quite sure to uh, keep everything uh, nice and, and, and clean, as it were. Um, now, as for the future, uh, assuming we don't have to worry about COVID-19 anymore, whenever that happens, which I think is a ways off, um, yeah. there will be, I think that uh, the, the, the savings uh, that may be seen in, in relatively small uh, cases, uh, and particularly which are strictly uh, commercial cases between two private parties. Uh, well, you know, I mean, let's save that, um, save that money. Let's not travel. Let's not do this and that, and, and we'll do it that way. But I think in the bigger, in the in the bigger cases, and the uh, what I would describe as more political cases where governments are involved in one form uh, or another, uh, or what I always refer to as bet the farm cases, uh, mm -hmm. everybody's going to want to get together. Uh, the, the considering uh, uh, what the overall costs of engaging in the arbitration are uh, on both sides, uh, the expenses involved are be fairly uh, fairly minor, and uh, of course the arbitrators uh, whose uh, <laughs> expenses are paid um, would certainly be happy to. Uh, to the extent they can to revert the old way where they can all have uh, m many times they've sat together before and they all know each other. But our community is uh, not uh, geographic, it's worldwide. So we don't get right. together that uh, often. I'm sure right. we'd be, be glad to have dinner together. Now, that's not a consideration. That would just be a side benefit. So you will have uh, some that will continue uh, to be virtual uh, and a um, number of others that will not be at all. Interesting. Okay, okay. Um, uh, you are an, um, an arbitration giant. So <laughs> I, um, I uh, if, if I'm not wrong, you are not a mediation practitioners or a mediator. But due to a coronavirus uh, uh, scenario, do you see... Uh, a rise in the use of mediation as a method of solving conflict in the international arena? Um, I, I, I don't know that I can um, say that the coronavirus would um, would promote that. I think it's the uh, 
uh, coronavirus affects that the same way it does uh, uh, arbitration. I do believe, however, since I've uh, had occasion to uh, study it and speak about it, the Singapore Convention mediation, I think, is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous mm-hmm. step uh, forward uh, right. because it will give international uh, disputes where the people uh, wish to mediate the advantage that um, if they meet the conditions uh, of it, uh, it can be enforced just uh, similarly to the uh, enforcement of arbitral awards under the New York Convention. And there are large right. l- large parts of the world that appreciate uh, mediation more than they do arbit- right, right. Arbit- arbitration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the Singapore Convention, uh, by the way, is already um, um, it's coming to force. Yes. Uh, so let's hope that uh, uh, those uh, mediation uh, agreements and mediation settlements can be uh, can be enforced as the arbitral awards are enforced under New York Convention. And talk mm-hmm. about New York Convention. Uh, talk about New York Convention. Uh, there are some discussions uh, uh, regarding the possibility or the idea of amending the New York Convention. Let's forget for the moment all the difficulties in the international public scenario of getting all these countries to agree. But in terms of uh, uh, substantively speaking, uh, do you, uh, would you like New York Convention to be amended? And if so, why, if not why? Right. Um, well, um... I'm not really an expert on the New York uh, uh, Convention. I say all um, spend st- spend all my time creating or being involved in awards, which somebody else then tries to get uh, uh, enforced. I'll say about uh, revising the New York Convention is uh, going uh, going back to the premise uh, that you stated. Uh, it's an old saying: "Be careful what you wish for." Don't open anything so well established to a hundred and more countries to uh, tinker with you won't like the result right 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 okay um uh, i know that um unfortunately our time is about to end but i have uh, a final question for you and this is a crystal ball question (laughs) <laughs> well, let's assume let's assume that we are in 2030 2040 2050 any crystal ball as to how international arbitration will look like by then yeah well if uh, you tell me what the world will look like then uh, maybe i'd be a- <laughs> maybe i'd be able to give a <laughs> give a prediction but it depends upon so many things political economic and and uh, and uh, and uh, cultural i certainly hope it uh, expect it will sur- survive i think it's in a period of potential uh, uh, transition um, not only because uh, uh, improvements are are constantly made uh, in it, but also um, <clears throat> just what will happen with the European Union idea um, uh, on this will have an influence. Maybe other things will have an influence. So I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm not a, um, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm uh, re- reluctant to, m- to make 30 um, <clears throat> year projections of what will happen anywhere. Okay. Okay. <laughs> are, are you, uh, are you, a uh optimistic person as to the future of the world? Oh, well, one has to be optimistic. It's our duty. Okay. Uh, if you're not optimistic, it's just like if, uh, if, if you're not an in internationalist uh, in, in this business, uh, you're in, you must be in the wrong place. So we have to be optimistic. Perfect, perfect. Uh, uh, Judge Broward. Thank you so, so much for your interview, your time. It's been fascinating. It's been very rewarding to exchange these thoughts with you. With that said, I'm going to ask Joel Moreira to step in and to conclude our uh, program today. Thank you very much. I thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Judge Brower. Well, um, 
My name is uh, João Ilho Moreira, and I'm one of the organizers of the fifth uh, Oxford Arbitration Day. I'm sure everyone like me enjoyed the fantastic speakers we had today. I'm here to tell you that unfortunately the fifth Oxford Arbitration Day has come to an end, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to, in the name of the Oxford International Arbitration Society, thank again our sponsors, uh, CAMCCBC, uh, ANSCOM International, the GST, Moraes Leitão, Tauli Shecker, Mayer Brown, uh, Aptigliano Advogados, Baraldi Mariani Advogados, Cachione Advogados, Lobo de Riso, Luca Advogados, Marcini Botelho Casal de Advogados, Rodrigo Mendes Advogados, and also uh, thank our inter institutional supporters, SBAR, uh, 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 o Comité Espanhol de Arbitrage, e, e TDM uh, Osmid. Uh, Finally, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Lauro and Fernando from Canal Arbitrage for their magnificent handling of all the technical issues related to this conference. They were part of one of, uh, they were an integral part of uh, the success of this event. Um, I also have to, to, to give thanks to my co-organizers, to Anna, Andrea and Philippe. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, as in all other years to work with you in organizing this event. And I'm very happy to see that all the hard work has paid off. Um, as you might be aware, this event partners up with Educa Foundation and the funds that we raise for um, sponsorships uh, will provide for a needs-based scholarship for a future master student. I'm very happy to inform everyone that we have yet again this year achieved our uh, fundraising goal. Um, with this uh, great news, I will conclude the event by thank you everyone that has attended today and by inviting you to join us in next year's event that hopefully will take place in Oxford and we can all meet there and um, have hopefully a great time. I wish everyone a great weekend and thank you for having joined us. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.